My name is Craig Morris. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you like. Uh, I'm happy to keep in touch with everyone. Um, I am currently a senior fellow at the IASS in Potsdam, outside of Berlin. Um, that stands for the Institute of Advanced Sustainability Studies. Now, no one knows what advanced sustainability is, so I like to talk about transdisciplinary research. No one knows what transdisciplinary means either, but we know what interdisciplinary means. Interdisciplinary is when maybe engineers come together with economists, so people from different fields working together. When people from very different fields come together, that's transdisciplinary. So we're talking about maybe engineers and theologists. We're talking about uh, economists and sociologists and anthropologists coming together. Why do we need to do that? Well, uh, for instance, when a, a utility wants to build power lines and people react, the utility has no expertise in dealing with the public. Right? The utility has technical expertise and financial expertise, but no sociology expertise. Okay? Uh, why do we need theology? Well, in Germany, as I'm going to show you, church groups have been at the forefront. They've been very much involved in the energy transition. And in the United States, we are losing because we don't have the churches on board, we don't have the conservatives on board, we are losing rural America when it comes to the energy transition. So this is not a technical question. We can talk all we want about how to get, how to get carbon emissions down and the technologies we should have and the, bio, the geoengineering and whether we have nuclear, but when the, the, the citizens decide to rebel against the system like they just did in America, we, all of our discussions are lost, okay? So we have just suffered a very severe setback because we don't talk enough uh, about citizens and, and society. The Energiewende is special because it started off as a grassroots movement. I don't know of another country except Denmark where a grassroots movement became national energy and climate policy. And that's very interesting uh, in several respects. Um, one thing that is uh, really interesting when you go back and, and, and read or, or write a history book, right? I've just published a, a history of the Energiewende. And, and one of the things that you, that you realize when you're writing the book is that you have to forget everything that you know and go back and look at all the options that were available then and realize this could have gone a lot differently. In fact, the outcome that we have is not the most likely outcome viewed from back then. To be very specific, no one in the wind or solar sector believed we would be this far today. And obviously, the, the nuclear and the, and the fossil fuel sector didn't think we were going to go so fast either. So we've gone faster than everyone believed. And we also forget a lot of the things that uh, didn't happen because we don't have anything to show for them. So they're just forgotten. One thing, if you ask people today, why is Germany doing this? What's the Energiewende? They will tell you, well, it's about climate change. And of course, the Germans are scared of radioactivity. You get that a lot as well. I don't think it's fear. I think it's a rational analysis, but we can debate that. But those are the two reasons that you're told today. We went back and found that neither of those reasons were there in the beginning. And this can be demonstrated. So in 1986, there was a cover story in Der Spiegel where they put the Cathedral of Cologne on the cover underwater and explained to everyone what climate change is. And the German public didn't really know that before then. It was a topic for experts. Something else happened in 1986 as well, Chernobyl, and that was really when the public really became aware of the risks of radioactivity stemming from nuclear power as well. So if it wasn't these two things, what was it? Well, you can go all the way back to 1974, and in fact, there was a book in 1980 called Energiewende, 
that's where the, the, coin, the term was coined in 1980. So it was six years old when the Spiegel article was published. And if you look at, this is a flyer from 1974 that was handed out uh, among the protesters at a nuclear plant, the first nuclear plant in the world to be blocked by citizens anywhere. And this flyer was handed out to the protesters giving some reasons why we should be against this. I don't have a pointer, but you can see the word radioactive here, but it's in the second paragraph, not in the first. The first sentence says, you can probably read this being, being Dutch, right? Um, the main risk, the main consequences of this planned nuclear reactor are going to be water vapor. Yeah, he's laughing. What kind of sense does that make? This was a farming community, and like the Netherlands, Germany gets enough rain. So they had done a study that found that the cooling tower at a coal plant or a nuclear plant produces a cloud all the time, and it increases local precipitation, rainfall, by 12%, something like that. And the farmers said no. We don't like that. Uh, it's rainy enough, you're changing our environment, and we don't want to have to deal with this. But there was more. It wasn't just that. Uh, this is actually a video. I don't think we have sound, but that's okay. I'll just read it to you as we go. It's a little video clip. This was one of the protesters. I'm uh, speaking in 2013, 39 years after uh, the original protests, explaining what they were protesting about. There were actually four reactors planned, and the citizens said, what, do, what are you going to do with the electricity? We don't need this. We're farmers. And the government said, no problem, we're going to bring in industry. And then the citizens said, oh, no. And the, the first company was a lead production plant. You know lead? Uh, the thing that was banned a few years later in basically all products? So the company was probably very happy that the citizens had banned its plant, right? Um, that's what these citizens were protesting against. It wasn't just a nuclear plant. It was a nuclear plant and a lead production plant. And they said what people are saying around the world today with fracking, you're going to come in to the companies. The companies are going to come in and privatize the profits. And you're going to socialize the risks. That was what this was originally about, okay? Other things, climate change and Chernobyl and radioactivity, all of that became important later. But this started off as a civil rights movement. And this guy here, yes, we have no sound, so he, he is saying, we protested against demonic and megalomaniac projects. People were to move from the valley into the mountains in France and Germany so that industry could spread unhampered along the Rhine from Rotterdam to Basel, getting energy from fleets of nuclear power. Okay, a lot of nuclear was planned. It wasn't just one plant. These were not hippies. These were conservative Germans who voted Christian Democrat. This is a picture of them. This is a picture of them. So the, conservative has, the conservatives have always been on board, okay? And what they decided was, we want to replace nuclear with something, right? Because the, the, the politicians said, well, if you don't want nuclear, what do you want? And they said, renewables and efficiency. Now, I have a question for you. This will be interesting for me in the Netherlands. How many of you believe that 100% is possible? Uh, that's roughly half the room. What did I just ask you, though? 100% red meat? Uh, you, you just answered the question anyway. You think I'm asking 100% renewables, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, Germany doesn't have a target of 100% renewables. Uh, it has a target specifically of 80% renewable power, 60% renewable energy, and, of course, energy consumption, primary energy consumption, will be cut in half in the process. So this will lead to at least an 80% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050. Now, there are countries that have a 100% target. Can you name? I can name three. Okay, somebody else said Costa Rica as well. Is that true? 
Okay, uh, okay, that, that would be four, all right, if, if that's... I don't know if Norway has a target. For the power sector, they're already there. But I don't know if they have a target. I don't know if Iceland has a target. Yeah? Denmark, okay, and one other, come on. The Netherlands. Yeah, I'm, and, and I got this discussion... Um, I got this discussion as well in Denmark last week. Uh, 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 some Dutch uh, students were in the audience and they said, that's not true because of some, there's some discussion or whatever. Yes, okay, I think, I think this is correct. You officially have some kind of target for renewables um, and, it, and it could be still like they're discussing it, right? Um, no, nobody's discussing it, nobody's heard of it, okay. <laughs> They're not doing it, right. Actually, um, I, I have to be faithful to my presentation. I have to say the following, because I promised everyone everywhere I would say this. The Danes know exactly what, how they're going to get to 100%, and the Dutch haven't begun thinking about it yet. So I'm afraid I've been saying that everywhere. I, I have to say it here as well. Very sorry. Uh, but those are the two countries that I know of. And in the meantime, since I made this presentation, Sweden has also adopted an official target, which is interesting because they actually have, I think, 10 nuclear reactors, which is actually uh, a lot for such a small country. Uh, but, but I wasn't really asking about uh, renewables. I was asking about 100% nuclear power. How many of you think that 100% nuclear is possible? Interesting, okay. That's, that's the largest um, reaction I've ever gotten, which, which is good because it simply means I'm not in my echo chamber now, right? There are some people we can have a discussion with here. We don't know whether we can go 100% renewables because no one has ever missed the deadline, to be fair. Right? We have some 2050 whatever deadlines, um, we're not there yet. But this is unknown, this is, you remember I said a minute ago when you read a history book or write a history book, you discover things that are forgotten because they didn't happen? You remember that? Nuclear. Man, is there a lot of stuff to learn about nuclear that didn't happen, like building them. And France, which is now known as a great success story because it has 75% nuclear power, they had an official plan, an official plan called the Mesmer Plan from 1974. It was 100% nuclear energy, not just electricity. So it was uh, tout électrique, tout nucléaire. That was their saying. Some people are nodding. You remember it from your childhood. Um, this was not a success. They, had, they would have had to have 170 reactors by 2000, and they never had more than 58, if I'm not mistaken. So that's not a very good target attainment rate. Uh, you can do this with any, any country you want. Um, I, I also looked at Euratom. Uh, for the young people in the room, if you don't know what Euratom is, just read the Wikipedia page on it. You'll be amazed that the European Union was founded partly to promote nuclear power. This is also forgotten today. Uh, Euratom did not do very well. Germany also at one point planned to have 45 reactors. It never got more than 19. Um, the next one's a little bit unfair because Nixon, President Nixon, didn't have an official policy of 1,000 reactors. He just said once when he was walking down the, the stairs off the airplane, I think we should have 1,000 reactors, right? Uh, so he just said it once. But that gives you an idea of how uh, high the expectations were for nuclear. This is also forgotten today. Um, someone sent me uh, uh, on, on Twitter uh, 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 an old text in Dutch about how policymakers said, we have to hurry up and use our gas because nucle once nuclear is there, we won't be able to sell it. That blew me away. But it fit everything that I found in every other country. That was the mood in the 60s. Okay. Um, and finally, I would encourage you, 
Also to look, you know, even if you go to countries like India, this is not just the West. Uh, if you go to elsewhere, you'll also find that other countries are not able to uh, meet their targets for nuclear. So you'll hear a lot about India in the next few years because they're, I think they just reached six gigawatts and they're, they're, they're now moving a little bit faster with nuclear, so you'll hear a lot about that. Remember the original target. And by the way, it's really hard to find these old targets. Nobody talks about them. They're forgotten. Now, all of this really only makes sense if we view it in a context. We have to really say, well, what moves faster? And to be fair, these nuclear projects, it's, it may partly be nuclear and it may partly just be big mega projects, right? There's, there's a certain difficulty anytime you build something big, the Hamburger Philharmonie, maybe you've heard of that. It's, it, the Germans can't build anything big either. The Berlin airport, all these things. Every mega project is a disaster, okay? So there's, there's part, part of that is just the fact that it's big. But we do see that, for instance, EU15, and again, you can do this in a lot of countries. EU15 had a target of 40 gigawatts by 2010. Around 2005, they had to change it because they were going, it was obvious they were going to surpass it. So they raised the target to 60, and then they hit 81.5, twice the original target, okay? Uh, you can do the same thing with solar. This is just one example. Uh, Germany had a Leitstudie uh, from 2008 that said in 40 years, so 2050, we want to have 29 gigawatts of solar. That was for 40 years later, four zero. Four years later, they hit the target for 40 years later. And we now have 40 gigawatts instead of just 29 for mid-century. And my question is really, where would we be if we move this fast with wind and solar under these conditions where we underestimate and don't try to go quickly? Where would we be if we had had ambitious targets and real ambitions for wind and solar, uh, like we had for nuclear. I think we would be much further along. Now, I also, before I move on, this is kind of a technical thing, but maybe some people in the room are thinking, Craig, you're comparing gigawatts of nuclear with gigawatts of wind. That's not fair. And you know what? You're right. And I have been standing at renewable energy conferences for a decade saying exactly the same thing. You guys from the, from the renewable sector are comparing a, a gigawatt of PV to a gigawatt of nuclear, which, and the nuclear produces six or eight times more electricity. This is the actual electricity. Wind power outstrips the growth of nuclear. This is the actual electricity in Brazil, and this is the actual electricity in China. It's taking off like a rocket. So again, if you compared gigawatts there, the number of turbines you build, you would have six times or five times more gigawatts for wind than nuclear, okay? But even taking account of that, we're getting more electricity. We're able to build and generate more new electricity from wind power than we are from nuclear in countries from Brazil to India to China, okay? So this is actually a phenomenon around the world, and you could do this. You'll be able to do it in the next few years with solar as well. Let's come back to Germany. Uh, this is renewable power production going back to 1990. Why 1990? Because that was the year when we had uh, reunification. So we had statistics for uh, one country at that point. And one thing that we, one interesting statistic here is that in 2009, the big four utilities that made up 75% of the power sector only owned 1% of the renewable power that year. This is Germany, sorry, this is Germany. Okay, so the big four in Germany owned only 1% of that, nuclear, of that uh, renewable power. Why is that? Well, one reason is they didn't believe that renewables would work. So at the beginning of the 90s, they had an ad campaign where they said, renewables cannot make up more than 4% of our power supply. Here's one of the ads. And the funny thing about this is we already had hydropower. That's the little blue area here. And so we already had 4%. So they were saying renewables can add 0% to the, 
to our power supply. They were very optimistic. And one of the people who repeated that claim from the ads was the country's environmental minister in the early 90s. Does anyone remember that person's name? Sorry? Hamon Sher was not, Hamon Sher at the time was in the opposition and the, in the Social Democrats. Angela Merkel was the country's <laughs> environmental minister who said renewables cannot make up more than 4% of our power supply. We're now at 35%. But the question really is, why couldn't these companies, why, why didn't they get involved? They weren't doing renewables, what were they doing? I'm gonna go through this very, very quickly, but we have a number of things every few years that kind of preoccupied them, and we discuss all of these in our book. Um, but the point is that you had every few years a discussion that seemed absolutely huge and that distracted them and if you believe that renewables won't make a difference, then you obviously, you know, your day is short, right? Uh, so you, you deal with all of these other things. Um, for instance, the nuclear phase out that became law in 2002, that began officially, the discussions began in 1993. And here's something I love as an American about Germany. This was Helmut Kohl, Chancellor Kohl, um, inviting the political opposition to the table, along with the utilities, to come up with a consensus on this. The Germans are great at consensus. Maybe this is, I understand that you have the Polder model. That's a little bit like that, isn't it? Well, be happy that you have it, because that's what America needs right now, is a little bit of bipartisanship. Maybe, maybe not a little bit, but a, a whole lot. But this was a very good example of that. Uh, Cole did not need to do this, and if he had been American, he would not have, have invited the opposition to the table, okay? So that, that discussion went on for eight years. But what I'd like to really focus on right now is the ETS, because something interesting happened there. The ETS is, is cap and trade, the emissions trading scheme, so the carbon price, right, all those things. It led to windfall profits. We, can, we describe the reasons in the book. They're, they're not controversial, okay? Everyone agrees that this happened. Um, the windfall profits summed up to around 31 billion euros for the big five utilities in Germany, the five biggest ones. Now, this was in 2005. We had a nuclear phase out in 2002, and you don't believe that renewables will work. Right? So what do you do, naturally? You have to replace the nuclear. Renewables don't work, so you build gas and coal. And that's exactly what they did. So they started building a whole lot of coal plants with money that they had basically gotten from a trading scheme that was actually supposed to stop or reduce carbon emissions by putting a price on it. Okay? It, added, it, it, it amounted to 37 plants in total, and there were a lot of reports at the time that Germany was obviously preparing to switch from nuclear to coal. Now, that's what the plans were. What happened was that a church group came in called the Climate Alliance, or Klima Allianz, and they worked with a group of conservationists called BUND, that's Friends of the Earth Germany, and they basically took to the streets and took to the courts and made it very difficult for these projects to move forwards so that in the end, 31 of the 37 coal projects were blocked. Only six of these plants were actually built, okay? Keep in mind that they were all planned back around 2008, 2006, 2008. Um, the, last, the last coal plant that received a permit was in 2009. So no coal plant has received a permit in Germany since 2009, all right? Um, what I find fascinating about this is that we have uh, conservatives and conservationists coming together in Germany and this doesn't even work in German, right? That's Konservative und Umweltschützer. You can't even do this. We have the overlapping in English. 
but only in the language, not in the society. We have to get the message across, and I'm speaking as an American, if you, if you feel like it applies here, um, this is an important lesson from Germany. You've got to have left and right working together on this. If it becomes a partisan issue where one side just doesn't like it, then you've got too much opposition, all right? Uh, the, the conservatives like to protect God's creation, and that's where they come in in Germany on this. Uh, before we leave the coal discussion, I just want to underscore that Germany has zero coal plants that it's added since Fukushima. All right. No, it had, since the accident, no coal plants have been added to the pipeline. So we're not adding coal to replace nuclear. All right, that was the utilities. I'd like to talk briefly about manufacturers and innovation. This is wind power uh, from going back to 1990. You see onshore the light blue area just now coming up. And if you ask most people, what are the two companies, what are the companies in Germany and in the US maybe that are the big turbine manufacturers? You will probably hear people say it's GE and it's Siemens in Germany. In fact, during the critical years, we have two chapters in our book of 15 chapters. Two of them are on innovation in the wind sector, just that. And it's fascinating. That's why we spent so much, so much time on it. It's fascinating. Most of this occurred in the 80s and the first half of the 90s. The wind turbines we are building today are basically the finished sort of uh, further developments of a finished product from 1994, something like that. But GE is not in the sector then, and Siemens comes much later. They were not there during the years of innovation. Why not? Well, talk to any company that, any big company that is trying to step up innovation with an incubator or an accelerator or whatever they're calling them. And they will tell you themselves, we kind of kill innovation. Even when we don't want to, we kind of kill it. And so we're trying to find ways not to do that, right? We want to stay in business, but we don't want to kill innovation. And so you had all of these startups in Germany. It was a very open market, a very competitive market. Newcomers faced low market entry barriers so they could get going fairly quickly. And this was very good for innovation during those years. Taka was one. Uh, Enron took over uh, another startup. Enron was not one of the startups. Bonus was one of the startups. And so was a German company called Enercon. Now, this is a really fascinating picture here. This is one of the older turbines from Enercon. The 18 is the length of two blades. So each blade is nine meters long. So I guess that's from here to the wall, maybe a little bit longer. Um, do you see the platform? You would stand out on the platform and open up the, the turbine like a truck, like the hood of a truck open it up and, and service the engine. That's how big turbines were around 1990. Um, does everyone see the truck today? This is the truck. The truck fits in the turbine. The truck fits in the turbine several times, actually. Um, those blades are now 60 meters long. The longest blades of wind turbines today are longer than the blades of any airplane ever built. If you're ever sitting at the airport looking at the plane that you're about to get on and thinking, they, they don't really fly, do they? That thing doesn't, does it really get up in the air? Don't, don't you all think that when you're looking out that you're like, it weighs so much, it weighs so much. How does it do that? Why don't we think that about 420 tons of metal up at the top? 400, 400 plus tons of metal up at the top and it's not, it doesn't fall down. It's on a little stick and it doesn't fall down. The stick is hollow. There's, there's like a ladder and an elevator. It's not, even, it's not even solid anything. It's a hollow stick with 400 tons of metal at the top and it doesn't hide from the wind. It doesn't do this into the wind, it does this. It resists the wind and doesn't blow down. This is amazing. 
And we did not know 20 years ago that we were ever going to have turbines this big. Okay, I've read books from 1992 that said 500 kilowatts is probably the maximum. Okay, we're building 8,000 megawatts now, all right? And blades much longer, okay? So we can, we can actually look at this and be proud of it in a way that we're proud of our old historic windmills that we use to, to grind grain and that you use to pump water, right? Um, this is actually a, a true achievement that needs to be sold that way. And so what we really need to do, just to finish up the innovation part, is we need to have markets that are not dominated by the companies that are going to lose if we have a fundamental transition. And I'm afraid the energy transition is the most fundamental type that we can have. It's going to be very fundamental, all right? So any winners that are on the market, it's kind of scary for them. Let's move over now to who built it. So we talked about the utilities only built 1%, the big ones, only built 1% by 2009. In that same year, the Pew Charitable Trust produced its annual study called Who's Winning the Clean Energy Race? And they talked about, uh, they list up countries in the order of how much money they spent, okay? It's a lazy analysis. They're not really saying, was the money spent well? That would require some real analysis. This is just a list of who threw the money at what, right? Uh, but they had Germany in seventh place at $4.3 uh, billion. And I looked at that and thought, no, that can't be right. Because I knew Germany was spending a lot more that year. And so I called up a friend of mine who worked at a, she collected the numbers actually in Basel for this study. And I said, Virginia, that's not right. And she said, Craig, look at footnote 48 on page 112, or whatever it was. <laughs> and I looked at that footnote and it said, we don't count anything smaller than one megawatt. And one megawatt is actually pretty small for a utility. Like a gas turbine, maybe 20 megawatts, but one? Nah, it's not worth building. So we had a problem because this is probably the largest solar array in Freiburg on top of the Freiburger Messe. If you take all of those panels on all the roof there and put them together, you get 225 kilowatts. If you had four times as much, you'd be too small by just a little bit for Pew. So this is what Pew was overlooking. Now to be fair, Germany was the only country building a lot back then in 2009 and it was the only country that had the statistics. And so the, the researchers, the, the finance people, they couldn't find the numbers. Now everyone's collecting the numbers. Okay, but this was the beginning of that process. And what we found in the end was that Germany spent $14.4 billion installing PV alone that year, and Pew had put them at 4.3 for everything, all clean tech. All right? This is how big, small renewables can be. Okay? It can be massive. You can really do a lot. And this is not something that the utility sector is used to dealing with or even thinking about. So who built it? Well, in 2010, we got the first numbers, the first pie chart with this breakdown. 37% was just normal people. 20% was farmers. Again, not just building PV. This is everything, and not just 2010, but all the way up to 2010. So the farmers were doing biomass, biogas, uh, putting up a wind turbine, okay? Uh, putting solar on their roofs. Uh, the people who normally dominate the sector, utilities and banks, made up 25%. And then we have this new interesting category of just businesses. So IKEA, right, put solar on their roof or something like that. This is happening a lot. You know BMW has four real industry size, uh, utility size wind turbines where it makes the i3 electric car in Leipzig. Did you know that? Four big ones, okay? So that would fit into this category as well. So there's just a lot more people building. And, and what I'm hearing a lot in the discussion is that we need to have this kind of participation so that there's acceptance, okay? Uh, if you look out your window and you see two turbines or you see some wind farm 
that somebody else built, then it's like, oh, you know, it's NIMBYism. You know NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard. So people don't like it, but as soon as you let them invest in it, they like it. Okay, that's, that turns out to be kind of true, but actually the bigger issue here is not how do we get people to accept what the utilities want and what the, the business world wants. The real question is, what happens when we allow people, the citizens, and new companies to become involved in this transition? Uh, this, for instance, is a side street in Vauban, which is a neighborhood in Freiburg, Germany. We get busloads of people coming in. I give a couple, when I live there, I'm now outside of Berlin, but when I live there, several busloads a year, I would cart them through this part of town. And I would say, you know, people don't park their cars in front of their homes, so those are the front doors on either side, and then you have a garden in the back. And I would say, you know, they park, they, they're not able to park their cars here, uh, you know, so it's a play uh, zone. That's what this blue sign means. Can everyone see the blue sign here? Uh, this blue sign up here means this is literally, legally a playground, all right? So you can drive up and unload your groceries, but you have to park in a garage. And you know what the question is that everyone asks? How did the government get people to accept that? It's a good question in a way because they came over to learn something and they want to take this back and, you know, do it at home. But what's the answer? The answer is the good question is a bad question. It's the wrong question. The question is how did the people get the government to give them what they wanted? Because the, the government didn't, this was not the government's idea. The government tried to block this. The people went to the government and said, okay, there's a new subdivision, a new neighborhood being developed. We don't want to have cars on the streets. And the city said, what? Uh, and the city said, you have to have a parking space. There's a federal law that still exists. If you build an apartment in Germany, you have to build a parking space to go with it. Still exists. And it's here too. And so the, the people said, well, we got to figure something out. We're not going to have that. And so I'm not going to tell you the details right now. We can talk about it in the Q&A if you want to know. Uh, but the, my point is here that it's really, once you allow citizens to, to bring in their ideas, you move faster sometimes than the government is really thinking and that faster than the business world wants to go because they might lose. They might lose some profits. Okay? So we've got, we have some pushback against citizens. It's not just that we need to get citizens to accept things, but actually citizens have some good ideas sometimes too. They're not just nimbyists and they're not just stupid. Okay? Sometimes they have really good ideas. My last two charts and then, we're, then I'm finished. Um, we, all, we, we talk about this today, not in terms of a civil rights movement, but in terms of carbon emissions. Now that's important. But what we have just seen uh, is that there's some uh, resistance to this idea. People are more worried about their own neighborhoods and their own well-being. They're more worried about their own jobs and what's happening five years from now, not a hundred years from now. And so I increasingly feel that if we want to move with carbon emissions, we have to start talking about other things that, pe that really concern people. Okay? I think people will go renewables if we allow them to have input into the, the discussion. But I think if we have more top-down decisions about this gigantic wind farm goes here and you have to accept it, then we're going to get more resistance along the lines of, okay, we can't say no to anything, can we? You top politicians, you didn't even ask us. And then you get resistance like we have in the U.S. against the entire system, okay? And I understand that Geert Wilders is also something like this in the Netherlands. I don't know, maybe I have some Wilders fans in the room. Um, but carbon emissions reductions are considered the main focus here. Don't worry, I didn't get any hands on that. I, everyone, everyone was quiet. What I'm actually saying is, the co-benefits are what we need to focus on. If you look at the IPCC report, 
You know that, the, the report where 97% of climate scientists invent this hoax about, that, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> they talk about 18 co-benefits. Think about that. At what point do 18 co-benefits become bigger than the one main benefit? At what point does making the world a better place in every way become bigger than just carbon emissions? Now, my co-benefits are not their co-benefits, and I'm not gonna talk about all these, don't worry. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in one of them, write it down and maybe ask a question later. Uh, these are not the IPCCs either, but it gives you an idea of things that we can talk about, right? My overall contention is that we need to talk about these things as the real benefits, and then say, and you'll get your carbon emissions reduction. If we do all this, if we go renewable and we become efficient, you will get your carbon emissions reduction. But we will make the world a better place as well. My final statement, the energy transition represents a one-time window of opportunity to democratize the energy sector. And what do I mean by that? I mean, we're gonna build up this stuff once, and once all the big wind farms are up and the big companies own them, uh, you're not gonna tear them down just so a community can, can build something. You're going to tell citizens, thank you for your idea, but uh, the grid is full, we don't need your power, and the utility did it cheaper, right? That's what we're hearing in Germany right now. And I'm just asking you, can we afford to keep doing this when there's an obvious wish from Brexit, from Trump, from Le Pen, from IFD, okay? It, there's an obvious wish of citizens to just, ha to just feel like we're taking them seriously and give them a voice. So we need to devolve decision-making down to the community level and let people actually have some input into these uh, decisions and they will develop the expertise that they need as we go, okay? That's my main contention, so I look forward to hearing your ideas about that. Thank you very much.